when the Buddha taught the practice as a path, one of the implications is that the path goes someplace, and that you follow the path because it takes you where you want to go. That would seem obvious. And that you read so many times that the path is the goal, or that it's a path without a goal. What kind of path is that? It's not really a path. You wonder what's going on. Think about the, the Buddha in his quest for awakening. They tell of his studying some very high levels of concentration. Which the teachers taught as the goal. One was the dimension of nothingness, the other was the dimension of neither perception or non perception. Yet the Buddha realized that neither of these attainments was the goal for which he was looking. And so he left those teachers and went off and tried to find another way of practicing that would take him to the goal that he had, which was the deathless. The happiness that was free from change, free from aging, illness, and death. So he tried austerities for a while, and they didn't work. Try them for six whole years. And you can imagine the amount of investment he had in hoping that they would work. I mean, you don't go put yourself through that kind of torment unless you think there's going to be a reward. And after six years, he realized there was no reward. So he's willing to drop that investment for the sake of something better. That's when he remembered the time when he was young. He'd sat under a tree while his father was plowing, and he entered the first jhana. And the question came to his mind, could this be the path? And he had an intuitive response, yes. So he followed that path. And he found that, found that it involved more than just the, the practice of jhana, but there, it was one of the factors of the path. And he finally figured out the remaining seven. And he fully developed, developed that path, because then he found that, yes, it did lead to the deathless. It did go someplace. Years later, he used the image of the path again. He said he was like a man who had gone through the jungle and found there was an old path that was all overgrown, but it did lead, lead to a, an old capital city that had once been prosperous. The buildings were somewhat fallen down, but they were still livable, and it was still a glorious city. So he went out and he told the king, get your men to clean this path. It'll take you to this wonderful, glorious city. So the imagery throughout is that you follow this path and it goes someplace. And the place where it goes is really special, free from aging, illness, and death, a happiness totally unconditioned. Now some people have raised the question, well, what about those attainments, the dimension of nothingness, the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception? Because after all, the Buddha does point out in some of his other suttas that you can take these attainments as the path. You know, based on these attainments, you can develop the discernment that leads to release.
what's the whole attitude you have toward them? Remember those teachers the Buddha had viewed these as a goal. Once you got there, you just stopped. That was it. You continued practicing these things, but that was it as far as, any, as they could go. The Buddha regarded them as a path. They went someplace. In other words, he used them as a basis for further insight. So instead of seeing them as goals, he saw them as a path. And he didn't equate goals with path. There was a clear distinction. It's like somebody getting through a forest and finally getting to a good road. But instead of following the road to a good place, you just lie down in the road. That's what those earlier teachers were doing. You know what happens when you lie down in roads. You get run over. Aging, illness, and death can come barreling down the road at any time. So when you get on the road, you follow it. You develop it together with all the other elements of the path, and you find that it really does lead to something special. So whatever you hear about goalless paths or paths that are goals. Just recently I read about a meditator who has been meditating for 30 years. He calls himself an experienced meditator, and he says he hasn't gotten anywhere. And that's perfectly fine with him, because that's the whole point of meditation, is realizing that you, there's nowhere to go. I don't know which is more disheartening, the fact that he's been such a lousy meditator, or that he feels so good about being a lousy meditator. You can't take those people seriously. You can't take them as guides. The Buddha did teach skills that give results. That, as he said, is the whole test for any kind of practice. He went to teach the Galamas. He said, when you see for self, yourself that following a certain practice leads to a blameless happiness. Okay, follow that practice. If you see there's a practice that's praised by the wise, follow that practice. If a practice leads to unskillful behavior, rooted in greed, anger, and delusion, unskillful behavior being in taking life, breaking any of the precepts, having wrong views, having greed, ill will. Any of these things, okay, realize that what that path of practice does, it leads you to a bad place. You don't go there. You follow the path that actually gives good results. This whole pattern of cause and effect, action and result, is our guideline. It's our test for what's a good path and what's not a good path. So when someone is bragging that they have a path that doesn't lead to results, you know that they've got a bad path. You look for the path that does give results and doesn't sneer at people who want to have results. It's another attitude that's very sad when you hear about people saying, all you want is happiness, all you want is an unconditioned happiness. Poor you. What's wrong with those people? What's wrong with wanting a happiness that's totally blameless, a happiness that doesn't take anything away from anyone else? Because if you don't have that kind of happiness, the only happiness you're going to find in life is a type that does take things from other people. I was reading a while back about a teacher who said he wouldn't want to live in a world without suffering because he wouldn't then be able to exercise his compassion, which is a very selfish view. You want, you want to be compassionate, and so it requires that there be people suffering. The best situation is to find a path that your happiness doesn't depend on other people suffering in any way, shape, or form. And then you can show that path to other people. And if they feel so moved, they can practice it too.
that's the way the Buddha taught, and I haven't seen any improvement on it since then. So there's nothing wrong with having a goal. As the Buddha said, the, the anguish that comes from realizing that you haven't reached your goal is much better than the pleasure that comes from indulging in sensual pleasures. He talks about worldly grief or householder grief and renunciate grief, householder joy and renunciate joy. Householder grief is realizing that you'd like to have pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, but you've got unpleasant ones. And most people, the, the antidote to that is to find the pleasant ones, i.e. householder joy. But that's not the path the Buddha recommends. He recommends if you have householder grief, try to replace it with renunciate grief. Now, even though things are uncomfortable outside, that's not the real problem. The real problem is that you haven't found a deathless happiness inside. That kind of grief motivates you in the right direction to follow the, the path that leads to renunciate joy when you realize that you have developed the qualities inside that really do lead to awakening. From there you go to renunciate equanimity, the peace of mind that comes when you've attained your goal. So although it is problematic if you have an immature attitude towards goals, it is totally possible to develop a mature attitude. Because the mature attitude is, really does le yield results. There is a deathless happiness, and it can be found through your efforts. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. <laughs>